I just want to take you back. It's November the 9th, 2016. A lucky few of us are crammed into a hotel room in Washington. It's doubling as our Newsnight office. And it's around 9 a.m. We've worked through the night, an election show, which ended a bit later than usual in Times Square, New York, followed by a mad dash headlong into the dawn rush hour of that traffic-clogged DC. I am unslept, bewildered, frizzy-haired, badly in need of a bath. <laughs> and Donald Trump has just won the presidential election. London is by now fully awake. They've got five hours on us. And from my editor, Ian Katz, comes an exhortation I will never forget. Do not normalize this moment, he says. And that's perhaps where it all began. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a huge honor to be here tonight. Thank you for bearing with the drop intro. You'll have to forgive me. I'm a pent-up broadcaster and I haven't been on air for five months. <laughs> so I said it's an honor, but it is also a responsibility. As Afwa was saying, it's a responsibility to get it right. And what I'm hoping to share with you this evening is the result of thoughts that have honestly been accumulating in my brain for years, certainly pre-November 2016, accumulated conversations with colleagues, arguments with friends, a bit of running commentary along the Thames towpath, and the excellent work of so many peers and academics. And I have been incredibly lucky in my career to have, I guess, had that chance to hold power to account. Princes, yes, prime ministers, presidents, <laughs> policy makers. But here's the thing. It, it is, it's got and it is getting harder. And tonight I want to just explore that because my suspicion, or no, okay, be braver, my thesis is that the political actors have changed. Politics has changed. But we, as journalists, have not yet caught up. But back to that DC hotel room. Anyway, it's a close-up on the illegible scrawl, this dog-eared notebook. This is me grappling now with my news night introduction for that night. And my editor's words still ringing in my ears. Now, he's not doubting the result or the democratic mandate, but he's insistent that we shouldn't move on too quickly. We should stay, as it were, in the fuck me moment. <laughs> and so I start to spell out what I'm trying to say. And I'm sort of scrawling and thinking and I'm getting my introduction together. And I say, to the names of Jefferson, Madison, Washington, Adams, we can now add Trump. <laughs> Taste it. Roll it around your tongue. America's president-elect is Donald J. Trump. But Washington is this extraordinary place. It is a well-oiled machine that uses power as its fuel. And within 12 hours of that shape-shifting election, it was doing what it did best. It was carrying on. The wheels of government start back up. Barack Obama invites Donald Trump to the White House. Michelle Obama reaches out to Melania Trump. And we watch the mechanics of that transfer of power, the 44th president welcoming in the 45th president, as if this slick political show could simply replace one protagonist with another. We did not yet understand that it wasn't replacing one man with another, but one set of rules with another. We didn't realize we would have to change too. And that's what I'm here to explore. So first up, I hope I won't disappoint when I say this is not actually a post BBC ex employee rant. I've had <laughs> seriously two decades of opportunity that could not be bettered. I owe my success and more importantly, my happiness to the friends, the soulmates, the work environment I had there and all the endless talking we did. But this is in a sense, an exhalation, a deep 
breath out. All the things that wisely could not be said then can be said more easily now. So I'm going to try and do that. And whilst this is a lecture, it's not meant to be a lecture. I mean, I must salute the incredible journalists who've been on this from the beginning, unafraid and undaunted. You know who you are. No, this is, this is more of a way of owning my mistakes by sharing them, hopefully speaking to a generation of newcomers to journalism who won't then make them. And I've called this lecture Boiling Frog, why we have to stop normalising the absurd. Because my contention is that despite Ian's laudable protestations all those years ago, we're becoming anaesthetised to the rising temperature in which facts get lost, constitutional norms trashed, claims frequently unchallenged. This surreal summer has been a prime example. A total disconnect between the dire warnings over energy and food bills that are massively hurting people in this country and the SW1 power vacuum circus. We followed Tory leaders on tour, assessing their views on the culture war, the price of their accessories, or a tax cut. We've heard not once, but twice from the front runner that a policy idea was misinterpreted by the media and that, my favorite, a question was asked in a left-wing way. <laughs> we then saw that same candidate caught privately apologizing to the presenter for attacking the media as if it had been an indelicate comment she'd made about his tie rather than a staple of our democracy. And we only know that conversation because it was caught on hot mic. That conversation should have been said out loud. This isn't normal, or rather, it shouldn't be. Things that for many decades were givens, the checks and balances on the executive, the role of the judiciary or the civil service or the electoral commission, a media free from interference or vilification now appear vulnerable. We're seeing politicians move in directions that are deeply and clearly deleterious to basic democratic government. So what has changed? Well, there's always been scope for abuse in our constitution, of course, but in recent times, so many previously settled questions around our democratic norms have been upended and at a staggering speed. Dr. Hannah White of the Institute of Government observes this is not about introducing change per se, which we've always seen. It's about people in power who are prepared to test the very limits of the constitution to achieve their aims. You don't have to look far for examples. Things that once would have shocked us now seem commonplace. The ministerial code violated with impunity, a blatant disregard for the principles of the cabinet manual, the unlawful attempt to prorogue parliament for five weeks by an executive that wanted to remove parliamentary democracy from the decision-making process. The blink and you miss it moment, the governing party's Twitter account changed its name to Fact Check UK, in the middle of an election campaign to cope party propaganda in a format that sounded objective. Or the admission by the then Northern Ireland Secretary that he'd be prepared to break international law, but only in a very specific and limited way. <laughs> like murder. I'm not sure the breaking of international law gets off the hook for being limited and specific. We can go on. Limits placed on judicial review, ministers' failure to defend the role of the judiciary, efforts to increase political control over public appointments, the attempts made to change parliamentary conduct rules for cronies. You know all this. You can join in the chorus. On the other side of the world, the former Australian PM, Scott Morrison, was discovered to have awarded himself the powers of five additional ministerial authorities. This autocratic indulgence signed off by the Governor-General, kept secret from Cabinet colleagues, from his Parliament, and from the Australian people. Not so secretly, Donald Trump unilaterally declared himself the winner of an election he lost. <laughs> this is just the context. Dr White believes the key dynamic here has been about privileging alternative sources of authority, the will of the people in the referendum, Johnson's personal mandate to try and stay in power, the shutting out of ethics advisers or the Lord's Appointment Commission when taking decisions. David Allen Green, the law and policy blogger, points to a failure of two 
what he calls safety mechanisms. The first being self-restraint of the executive, the second being the gatekeepers of cabinet and the cabinet office who are meant to step in when all else fails. 